Sarah, thank you so much for this wonderful performance and, and many thanks to the entire creative team, of course, including the musicians who let us um, play their recorded music you know, as we couldn't bring them over. Um, I have a question which is obvious, and that is, could you just say a few words about uh, how this came about, whether you wrote an essay first which developed into a performance or... Um, yeah, well, uh, I think this should have come first. But, um, the piece was written, I mean, the piece was produced by Holy Show, who started uh, Wear Our Magazine, but they also do different productions. And the premise of Holy Show is a kind of, I mean, Brenda would probably explain this better than me, but um, I mean, in Ireland, the expression to make a holy show of yourself is to kind of like to do something embarrassing or humiliating in public. Um, but it's also a kind of a play on, I think, how, especially in Ireland, we're a, we're a previously very religious country, and now we, uh, we're less religious, and so we're kind of finding these other ways to create rituals or ceremonies or sort of um, substituting for that kind of um, very organized, yet also perhaps spiritual culture. And so that was kind of the idea, um, not that the pieces in the magazine were so prescribed, but I think I've definitely had that in my head when he asked me to write something. And it's something that is comes up again and again in my work. I'm someone who was raised very Roman Catholic, as I talk about um, in the piece. But then uh, now at this stage in my life, I sort of abandon religion, and yet I also feel sort of sympathetic towards religion. So I've tried to create these rituals in my life all the time. Um, but they're kind of specific to, um, to, to me and to my, you know, my small family or, um, whatever. So the, the piece was kind of about that. Um, and it was interesting how the, the, the films were made before I wrote the piece. So I had seen them when I was writing it and I was trying to find echoes in what I was writing about, um, from things that they'd said and it just, you know, it fitted together, but you know, as I warned you beforehand, it's kind of, there are these little connections that run through the pieces, but there's not this overarching story, you know, you don't have to worry you can't follow or you think you're not following it. It doesn't really matter. Like this, you're just making connections, I think, along the way and kind of getting the atmosphere. Um, and it was interesting, really interesting watching it here because it's the first time we've done it outside Ireland. And there were lots of things that, you know, perhaps references that, that would be easily understood. But then I also thought it was kind of a nice picture of just Irish people in rural places, you know, making things and kind of um, bringing back to life these rituals that King sort of okay. converts around sea swimming <laughs> accidentally. And, and do you know how the artists were chosen? I mean, because there obviously there are just so many pieces in the Holy Show and, you know, f it features many visual artists as well. Why these particular three? Um, well, I think the, the, the kind of um, overlapping of concerns, probably. Um, I mean, with the Gary Coyle, who is the artist who swims in the sea, that obsessive act becoming the subject for the art. Um, and then... The, with Laura again, with the sort of using of stones, and um, and then with Natalia at sort of using music to collecting sounds, and then I mean it was a loose connection, I think. Um, but uh, I I think I had said that I was really interested in people who uh, who who made things, and that I wanted to write a piece that maybe brought in other artists that um, that kind of just created this idea of a community, even though we're all solitary. Thank you. And uh, now in the in the video uh, that features you, uh, we saw quite a bit about how you work as an artist, what kind of strictures you give yourself uh, when you when you make art. Uh, could you say what kind of something about what kind of strictures or confines is the word that you actually use? You give yourself as a writer, and uh, and how you work with the particularly with the autobiographical material, because there are even in the novels there, there there's obviously quite a bit that comes from your life and your experience. Yeah, um, in the latter, the video with the swimmer with Gary Coyle, um, he talked about how he's taking material from his life all the time, and that was what his father did as well as a painter, and his father was painting the streets and the people of Deliri, which is the town. Um, and he's doing it a different way. He's found a different way to do it, but he's essentially just 
you know, treading that same terrain. And for the first time tonight, it actually struck me that that's something that, that comes up in each video really for each artist is that you're kind of not casting the net too far, but living in a very small world and perhaps sometimes quite constraining set of circumstances, but, and finding inspiration in that and, and finding material. And I mean, that's the way I write as well. You know, like the, my first novel, um, which was published here as well, was very much, uh, it was drawing from my life, but it was also a novel about a man and a dog in a place. And there was a beginning, middle and end. And the more I've written, the, the less plot there's been. <laughs> and the more about, the more drawing from my own life it's become. And in a way that, you know, I, it's a failure of imagination. Um, but in, I don't beat myself up for it because I feel like it, uh, you really can't write well about things that you're not interested in, that you're not connected to. Um, like, you know, I even said to Brendan earlier, uh, I was like, it's been a while since I've performed this piece and I was sitting in another teller and trying to remember how I had really cared about the things I was writing about at the time that I wrote it. You know, I was kind of forgotten them. You know, they don't mean as much to me now, maybe like the bird watching. But at the time, I really cared, and I had to, you have to kind of connect with that and remember. So, so yeah, for me, it's just you have to care about the thing that you're writing about or making art about, and and then it will be good, even if no one else thinks that's good. You <laughs> better. And and do you need routines as a writer, as well? Because um, I think you said somewhere that that writing is is quite a different thing from from making that kind of art, right? That that's you know. Uh, you sometimes find yourself struggling with language because you just, just to f try and find the right word, you know. So do you need routines that will allow you to work even in circumstances where, where the word is just not coming? Yeah, yeah, it's funny. I mean, I've, I've never really had blah, writer's block. It's more always like there's too many things to write about that I can make time for. And um, I was, I, I kind of have to write in the mornings. I think a lot of writers say that. Um, that by later on in the day, it's, it's uh, you're less focused or something. Um, but I, yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess I have rituals. The rituals are kind of boring things. So like, you know, I make coffee at a certain time. I have a sort of staggering portions of snacks throughout them. I never write for, for long at, at one stretch, I think, because that it, you start to hate it. And then as soon as you hate it, it's not going to, you know, you're going to kind of lose, lose focus. So, like, short bursts of time. Thank you very much. Now, um, if I can turn to Alice, I'll just say a few words about Alice Hermanova McIlvin, who um, is, of course, a renowned translator of uh, Irish literature, but not just Irish literature. She won the Magnesia Litera Award for uh, the translation of Sarah's first novel, Spill, Simmer, Falter, Wither. And she was nominated this year uh, for the same award uh, for the translation of Seven Steeples, which is which is uh, Sarah's latest. You can see the cover here. Uh, the books are still available if you're searching for copies of the first two novels that Alita also translated. Uh, they are they're available in bookshops or through uh, the distributor Cosmas. You can't get them from the publisher anymore. So that this just in if you're interested in, in Sarah's work in, in, in Czech translation. And, and again, my, my first question for Alice is, is, is a fairly obvious one. How did you come across Sarah's, Sarah's work? How did you discover it? Do you remember? I think, well, yeah. Which way? This way, yeah. <laughs> my God. That mm -hmm. yeah. um, I discover it so how you discover most things, just the looking what's new in the uh, published in Irish literature and uh, it was the title of J mm -hmm. that got to me uh, and it was um, yeah I I look at the thing before I read it I thought how would I translate the title mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then I started reading and I thought oh my god how would I translate this and that and the other and then I so the reason of it and the, the language are of course the dogs. Say the dogs. And the, I actually the, tried to um, uh, call them in the, the publishers. You take this on. And so I wrote a little synopsis. Uh, 
and one man and a doll. <laughs> Little man dies. <laughs> now, uh, so I did a short um, uh, excerpt from uh, like a translation. And, and what were the greatest challenges of translating Sarah's work? Because uh, linguistically, it it is quite a challenge. I mean, just to, you know, stylistically, and uh, and and also you have to make all kinds of decision concerning what they call realia. And uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, I um, yeah, I found this. Uh, the first thing was I found a word on the first page that I didn't find in any dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> it was just four words, four words, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I started the research and then I decided I have to contact the writer. And then I found that the unlikely thing that it's a, it's, it's a young woman. It was encouraging and I made contact with her and she was absolutely brilliant. She was the, the, the best to work with because she's so... <laughs> <laughs> she was so humble. She actually apologized for everything I asked. <laughs> she said I should have put it better. It is actually that clear. <laughs> and the word spore... Uh, <laughs> um, it exists as a, a spoon and a fork, right. uh, but that certainly wasn't that. And it turned out that it was a wire to your mother to lose the well, yes. wire girl. And she said, I thought it was a legitimate work. <laughs> <laughs> no editor found it strange. No, in English I got away with it. Yeah. No English editor said that. Wonderful. And uh, could you, I don't know how many people will be familiar with Seven Steeples here, but uh, the characters, uh, the, they're two principal characters and they have, their names are um, sort of domestic, domestic forms of existing names, but at the same time, they're speaking names. Uh, and uh, if you could say a few words, I would say about how you worked with that because because obviously with the original words it wouldn't work in the Czech language, so you have to find different names and uh, and different speaking meanings to them. Yeah, I it, um, I, I asked uh, Sarah, of course. Uh, I said I think they the sort of characterize the in the jokes that she she talks all the time. I don't know, I. And imagine her quite, quite loud, high voice. That was the bell, the ringing bell. Uh, so I saw, and she said, yes, yes, yes. And he is the, he, he is the um, sigh. It has to do with his, the, and him being quiet, being like, um, the not talking very much, being introverted and smoking. And I thought, hmm, that was kind. The, the, the bell, I, I thought, bell did, did, didn't go in any check thing. I thought, and it could be that it could find the real names. So that was Lutzinka. Uh, but for us, that was more difficult. But I found to my joy that Achil is a legitimate name. Shiniku bear that name. Wonderful. Thank you. The last question, perhaps, for you, Alice. Have you tried to persuade a publisher to uh, publish also Sarah's handiwork, which is, let us say, work of nonfiction? Absolutely fantastic, but of course not the kind of thing that that's, you know, uh, might necessarily be commercially viable. I, 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 did. I did very strongly. And um, uh, he said that, you know, it's... Uh, 
I don't know. The way that she writes another novel. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's an assignment there for you. And, yeah. and, 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 so came, so mm -hmm. that's yeah. how. And I, I was very sad about it. It's a wonderful book, it really is. It wasn't, it wasn't published in any other translations. I just Dutch, it's gone into Dutch at the moment. I know. It's okay, uh -huh. it's not the first uh -huh. before I want. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> right. Perhaps a last question, Sarah, for you before we open up to the audience. Uh, uh, if it's not a secret, and, and I know some writers don't like to divulge this, but uh, could you say a few words about what you're working on now? Um, yeah, no, I don't, I don't really mind um, if I curse authentic. <laughs> um, no, I actually have a piece. Uh, and, uh, I've already had sort of an extract published, and I have another extract published. Um, and it's non-fiction, so it's probably not commercially viable. It's actually, the book I'm writing at the moment is more like, like commercially non-viable, <laughs> unpublished in translation book than any of the others. Um, but I'm writing about painting um, and, uh, and about friendship, but specifically about my friend who is a painter. Um, and uh, it sort of has a, yeah, I mean, that, that's it really. But it is, I guess, more widely about painting. I've always worked as an artist, but I've actually never really painted. So it, it kind of holds a fascination for me. Painters are more of like writers, maybe, than any of the other. They kind of have this weird, devotion to this one particular medium and the history of this medium. I've just always been fascinated by mm. not even painting, painters, people who paint. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, the book is, the book is about that. It's, it's a little, it's not going to be long, but it's going to be a uh -huh. while away yet. And, um, uh, yeah, and hopefully it works out the way I'm, I'm picturing it at the moment. It's, um, I was on a list that earlier this year of best young novelists under 14. And I feel like, that's cursed me because I honestly don't think I'll write a novel ever again. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you do. Uh, now, can we open this to the floor? If you have questions, I'll, I'll just run around with this mic. Uh, Hello, sorry, massive fan um, to start off. Um, but I wanted to ask because I've had the privilege of hearing Alita talk about the translation process. So I was really intrigued what it was like for you, whether, um, you know, there was something really surprising about being translated, where you got a question maybe um, from any of the translators and you thought like, why would they even need to know this? Like, this seems so strange um, that that would play a role in language. And then um, a second question being, because um, your work so often described as being so poetic, um, I wondered about your relationship to poetry um, and whether that's something you engage in or, yeah, your relationship to it. Oh, well, with the translation question, like I'm continually surprised by questions that people ask. And um, it was one of my first translations, I think. Um, and, you know, she, she's absolutely right when she said there were things that threw up that I was confounded by how closely a translator will read a sentence, you know, like really they've thought about it nearly as much, if not more, than I've thought about the sentences. Um, and there were small things that, I guess, a use of a word that, that I shouldn't have used um, in English, but that it slipped past everyone apart from the translator. Um, and it's funny, you know when the translator is good, even though I don't speak any other languages, but you can kind of tell from the strangeness of the questions or the incisiveness of the questions. Um, but, there, I mean, there are a lot of things, I think, um, with in Ireland in particular, and we, we've been talking about this just um, on this trip, um, about how I, I can't imagine how uh, someone who translates, uh, say, even an English person, um, would translate an Irish book with the same kind of finesse as someone who lives in Ireland, you know, and understands the culture, because there's lots of kind of little words and nuances um, that mean one thing. Um, in Irish, but are, are, you know, in, in English, Irish and Anglo Irish that don't mean anything beyond that. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I'm continually surprised by things. And I mean, I learned things from that, from you about cows, about deer <laughs> that I didn't know, but that just used a rather term. Um, and as for poetry, yeah, I mean, I've never written poetry and, um, I guess 
I, I don't know. I, maybe maybe it, the prose is poetic because I kind of have a visual artist. I may, I'm looking at the world from a very visual point of view, so I'm more inclined to describe things and to look for kind of precision in descriptions of things, which is poetic. Um, but I know, no, poetry is a bit like painting. It's one of those things that you can't, you can't get it wrong, you know, that, that poets and painters are so puritanical almost to what they do. I would never even try it. I'd be too, too nervous to ask. I'm just going back to what you were saying about the choice of these three artists that you used in the documentary. And it, it seemed to me that something that kind of pulled them together is the way they're using nature as a lens through their art. And it's not like they're sort of using nature as a tool. Nature is the lens through which the art seems to be processed. So one person is walking through the landscape and seeing the stones. The other person's literally immersed in the sea, photographing it. And the sea becomes its own interpretive context for the art rather than an artistic medium itself. And I'm wondering if that's something that you're approaching as well, if nature functions as a lens. So you're creating these birds in this one project. And what, why those birds? Like, why, why create those physical objects? Like, what's, what's happening in terms of your relationship between your artistic vision and the way the natural world is lensing it? It's really good observation because I don't know that we make the connection so much. Um, and then with Natalia, who's the last video, she's recording the street and yeah. making them through music. So yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's a really good observation. But the birds, God, I mean, like I obviously don't really know. I didn't. I was sort of illustrating something I'd written with the birds, and. The work that I make, it's kind of more like, it's very narrative. The art that I make always tells a story about something. It's not sort of chin stroking art, you know? I, that's a terrible way of putting it, but you know, it's not deeply sort of philo philosophical. It's just telling the story about something that's, that's happened in my life. So like, I got really interested in Murray. I read this great story about, um, how no actually sorry i was already making i made a bunch of container ships with sails actually they didn't have sails at the time Phil was me because i just thought it was such a neat idea and then i discovered that they are actually making container ships with sails on <laughs> um in order for them to be more environmentally friendly and efficient because they they use a huge amount to fuel container ships and they're bringing useless stuff around the world every day so i was just kind of captivated for that quite a period of time well yeah for a period of time and then i wasn't and started making something else my greatest um, era as an artist is that I don't, I'm kind of interested for a certain amount of time and that I never really finish anything and then I go on to the next thing. Um, but it's not, yeah, I mean, it's, I guess the landscape is just there. I don't really answer your question, but I, I don't really. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much uh, for coming uh, and for sticking it in this uh, temperature in a Zeppelin. Uh, we are all very grateful, and uh, if you could please join me in a little round of applause for Sarah and her team and for Alice and her translations.